Hello, welcome everybody to the first predictive text event from Future Tense, uh, a regular series where we will discuss how the past, present, and future of language collide. Uh, my name is Gretchen McCulloch. Uh, I am here hosting this event. Um, Future Tense is a partnership of Slate, New America, and Arizona State University that explores emerging technologies and their impact on society. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here today uh, with Maria Devon Headley, um, translator of Beowulf, uh, and Elena Smith, the creator and showrunner of Dickinson on Apple TV+. Uh, and first, we're going to start out with a special treat, uh, which is a live reading uh, of a portion uh, from uh, the Beowulf translation um, with uh, Dan Kois and Natish Pawa from Slate, uh, and they're going to be reading a passage for us. Near Hothgar's feet squatted Unferth, Etchlaf's son, unconvinced, whispering churlish words. Beowulf's bravado bristled him, and envy ate him alive. He'd historically been glorious, and the notion that another, more notorious under heaven, might enjoy greater greatness made him gnash. Bro, do you happen to be the Beowulf who challenged Brekka in the open ocean? insisting you should swim in shark seas for no reason but to prove your petty prowess, boasting that no boat should guard your lives, but that you should risk them recklessly. I heard no one could convince you to of clarity, that you dove overboard, surfing on stupidity, swearing you knew the currents better than any other, and that you, swole as a troll fed on travelers, were superior to any swell. You lulled for seven nights in wintry waters, and in the end, he outswam your fool self, skipped to shore unscathed through, though uncertain, and rolled onto the sand safely in the land of the Heathoremes. From there, he went to his home country, where the Brandings adored him, a calm and pleasant place, and returned to his hall, his host. His boyish boast was proven, yes, he bested Beowulf, no matter your other battles the tales you told, the lines you sold. Buddy, at least you lived. This time, bro, know it. No one's ever lasted a night clasped in Grendel's arms. Beowulf, Edgethau's son, wasn't phased. Well, actually, buddy, sit down. You're drunk. Unferth, you've run your mouth about Brecca, me, and our sweet sea swagger. But let me drop some truth into your tangent. I've been better on the water deeper in the drink, and stronger in the swim than any man alive. Brecca and I were boys together. Our desires were only dares, one upon the other, brother to brother. Maybe you know the story? But hold up, I forgot. You've got no brothers left. We declared ourselves adventurers, and so we swam, swords and hands for safety, unsheathed, father forged. We knew there were sharks. No one here is stupid. He couldn't float freer or swim straighter than I, and I had no urge to leave him or lose the lesser swimmer. I was Brecca's lifeguard. I knew my duty. The rains rocked us and the storms shook us, and for five nights we floated, warring against winds from the north, the waves like blades, bone cold, until at last we were blown apart, the biting beasts of the bottom rolling up to ring me, wrestling me to the seafloor. All that held me was my armor, clasped hands made of gold, chain mail gainsaying waves and wet, the work of ancestors forging my ferocity. It kept me bold enough to fight when a monster dragged me down and gripped me, ripping at my skin. I was pinned, swaddled in squalor. Last chance, I took it. I put that monster down. I made it a sleeper as it leapt, severed its spine, spiked its skull, and split it into smithereens. My own strength sank that sea monster. And soon I was fighting again, lower than any human sight, outside even the edges of God's light. Dark deeps, hell's creatures in them, swinging my sword beneath the eyes of the world. I would not be eaten, nor beaten, no skewered swimmer I, no drowned dinner for a circle of cold companions, gobbling my guts, glutted on my gold. At dawn, I surfaced in a slurry of scales, floating flotsam where formerly there had been fangs, I'd sacrificed myself to save every subsequent seafarer from deep despair, and the monsters of the dark were gone. The east was gilded with God, and the sea was smooth. 
I could see the shore, the strong prelates rising, built of their own bruises. If a man's brave enough, fate, when on the fence, will often spare him. I'd never brag, but the truth is, my sword slew nine singular scavengers that night. There are no ocean-going stories more awful than mine, no tales of greater terror, no other man so sea stalked, but I survived, my salvation in my own hands. The waves bore me shoreward, attending me, and left me at long last in the land of the Finns. The end. I've racked my brain, bro, but unfirth, I can't unpack any similar stories of heroics from you. Let me say it straight. You don't rate, and neither did Brecca when it came to battle. The gulf? You're cattle, and I'm a wolf. I'm not even mentioning your sins, your kin killing, your brother beating. I'm not the man to damn you. No shit, though, Unferth. If you were the bitter brawling brave you claim to be, your king wouldn't have suffered a single night of Grendel's rampage. No bitten bones, no hall horror, no chaos in his kingdom. Grendel was aware he had nothing to fear here. Your sword soft, son. No warrior awaited him in Harrow. The shieldings were unshielded, their hall unguarded. He knew he could crush you, comfort himself with grappling, grind your bones to make his bread. He's got no fear of beer hall, brothers, but this you can quote, he'll fear me. There are no guns of note on anyone but me and my gates. Come on, Etchlaf's son, beat me. Or better yet, make me a bet that Grendel's maker won't be met. Then, if you brave boys feel like drinking, I'll serve you ale for breakfast. The sun shining on silver and gold, daylight yours after night's been mine. The end. Well, not quite the end, but we can't read the entire thing because uh, we'd be here for hours and uh, we'd be interfering with the audiobook, which is already really great. <laughs> uh, so thank you uh, to Dan and Natish for, for reading us uh, this really fun excerpt. Um, and thank you to Maria for, for writing it. And we're gonna get to see uh, a clip of Dickinson uh, a little bit later. So stay tuned for that um, so you can kind of participate in, in seeing these, even if you haven't necessarily read or watched all the things, because there are lots of things to read and watch these days. Um, but yeah, let's let's start with the panel part. I'm excited. Um, I think that one of the things that I am I notice about both uh, the, the Beowulf translation and Dickinson is they've gotten a lot of attention for how they use, uh, you know, social media, words or modern day vocabulary, you know, sit down, you're drunk, uh, these kinds of things in the reading. But there's also a very, what feels like deliberate use of uh, historic stuff as well. Uh, so you have, um, in Dickinson, you have, you know, excerpts from Emily's actual poems. Um, you have, you know, bits of her language directly from the poems are incorporated into the into the thing. Uh, and in Beowulf, you have this sort of juxtaposition between um, with with the with the use of kennings, which are this old English, you know, rhetorical device uh, of of you know compound compound nouns like whale road for sea and stuff like that, which which you do render so. Yeah, I'd like to start out by asking you to talk both to talk a little bit about um, how you chose which elements to render very literally and which elements to say, no, I'm going to do this sort of modern adaptation. Let's start with Maria because uh, we just heard from Beowulf. Um, and I want to say thank you for that reading. That was so great. Um, how did I choose which elements to, to modernize? I mean, there's been a lot of press about the translations and it implies, I think, that the whole thing is, is in internet slang, which it's not. It's um, it's just sort of salted throughout. But conceptually, I wanted to give us the sense, really the sense of sort of bro culture and bro storytelling. So I, whenever there was a moment to um, use the original text to imply that someone is really, <laughs> for lack of a better term, like sort of shaking, shaking big dick energy, um, that was what I did. I was, cause there's a lot of it. There's just a lot of, of 
braggart stuff happening throughout the whole poem. It's a poem about making yourself big so that you can have status in the society as a man slash hero slash warrior. So it's all consistently um, that. And we have a long standing through line <laughs> through society, through a patriarchal society that we have of that kind of language. So whenever I saw something that looked like that in the old English, I was like, okay, it's the same kind of thing that we say now. It's just, I've just changed it to um, the words that we use now, which are things like bro and swole, like when he's, when, and guns on my gates, you know? Um, I, I felt like we would understand it even juxtaposed with the archaic stuff that's in there because there's also a lot of archaic language, but I felt like we would be able to read the two things next to each other just because of the kind of uninterrupted through line of masculine performance <laughs> societally. Yeah, it seems to show up at sort of those most emotive moments, mm -hmm. like the dragon putting the world on blast. You yeah. have this sort of, okay, the dragon is feeling something really, really strong and, and putting the world on blast. But then you also have these bits of, you know, a lot of alliteration, which is a very old English thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to use the style of, I mean, lots of people who've translated it feel like and some people feel like I've done something really wicked here because I've, I've gone in and modernized and made it feel like something from our world. Um, and some people feel like that's a bad thing to do because we should understand how foreign Old English culture, early English culture is to our culture and Old English language and poetry. But I felt like we, we do have some dragons and armor and boar helmets and war, we have that in, in the poem, it's part of the story. So we have those elements. You're not changing the like, dragon to like, oh, you know, she it's actually a pet dog or something. Or yeah, it's exactly. Actually I mean, an ogre. <laughs> yeah, so the alliteration is from the Old English style, as is some of the rhyme a little bit. Um, and I use those things to make us remember that this is a poem, that this is a poem from a culture that's different from our culture. But we also still have a through line of alliteration and rhyming poetry in our culture now. It's something that we've had the whole time. Again, another under, uninterrupted through line. So I think it's, um, it's, it was fun for me to to feel the 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 common ground and also to at the same time be pointing out things that make no sense to us in our world today. Yeah, absolutely. Elena, do you want to do you want to talk about how you, you know, chose which of of Dickinson's poems to to feature and how to sort of interweave them into the storyline? Well, um for for the that was all so interesting, Maria. Thank you so much for that. And I have so many thoughts off of what you just said. But um yeah, I I um I mean, I mean, Emily's poems, they're not just like interwoven into the story. Like the story is sort of, I mean, the show is made out of Emily's poems and it's made out of her poetic spirit. Um, and in some ways, I mean, it's great to be on this panel because I think that actually a very useful way to think about Dickinson is as a translation. Um, it's, it's, it's a translation, for, for me, it's a translation of, Emily Dickinson, the icon and the cultural figure and what she means for us today, but it's also a translation more broadly of the 1850s in America into today. And really what I'm trying to do is use, um, is use the mid 19th century as a kind of funhouse mirror for looking at where we are today, which is something that uh, was already very interesting when I started working on Dickinson back in like 2014, 2015, but now has like accelerated to the point where it's actually terrifying. <laughs> so, um, yeah, really. uh, but um, yeah, I mean, as far as like the act, you know, the, the sort of high, low juxtaposition of language and when do people sound period and when do people sound modern or internet, <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's not like a hard and fast rule about it, but I think that in the show, it tends to break down um, along a line of sort of um, generationally and, and, and in terms of like social formalities. So when somebody is in a place like Mrs. Dickinson, who's typically like pretty constrained by the expectations of her age, she will tend to speak um, in a more period appropriate way. Um, whereas someone who's rebelling against those constraints like Emily 
will be um, saying, you know, this is such bullshit when somebody tells her to go get water. Um, and, uh, but even in a time, but even within a character like Emily, she can behave more formally and more period appropriate when that's emotionally um, apt for where she's at, which usually um, there are more serious times or times when she is feeling um, the constraints or trying to, trying to present herself in the way that society expects her to. I noticed that one of the things that Emily does is sometimes she refers to her parents as mother and father, and sometimes yeah. she calls them mom and dad. And it seems like it sort of indicates different things at different times. That's an absolutely perfect example. Um, and something that when I'm writing a script, I'm really actively thinking about, like I just wrote a scene, I just wrote a scene for an, future season, but where um, where Emily and her dad um, have a are having a conversation. And in this one scene, she calls him dad at one point and father at another point. And so that it's like a weird, but it's like emotionally, it made sense to me um, that why at this moment when she wants to sort of really consecrate a promise that they're making to each other, she calls him father. But when she's just kind of like hanging around his office bothering him, she calls him dad. Yeah, so it's, it, and it's, which is a similar sort of thing as it's not a just, okay, you know, if it was a straight modernization, she'd just be calling him dad the whole time. But it's, right. the, here, what, what can we take from the things of this era and how can we just juxtapose them with? Well, I mean, I loved the fact that, Maria, that you immediately started talking about patriarchy, right? <laughs> because... I mean, and I'm almost like, okay, now we can just fast forward to like the end of this panel where we realize that this is all about patriarchy. But like, you know, I mean, it's just, it's very interesting. Like why is, why is slang lower on some cultural hierarchy than, you know, correct English Right, like it, it's, it, it, it all goes, I mean, like, like, like all kinds of power and power dynamics are embedded in language, right? And the idea that someone could be shocked by a modernization of a classic, um, that speaks to a perspective of someone who's trying to sort of protect those classics from disruption and accessibility, you know, for, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> so many reasons, like the, <laughs> the like, games. The, I mean, Dickinson is about patriarchy and yeah. it sounds like Beowulf is too, so. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and they've also got this sort of like, I want to say Beowulf even has daddy issues as well. Because <laughs> uh, there's this line, we all know a boy can't daddy until his daddy is dead or something like that. Yeah, I put that in with some sort of multiple regions of subtext because of course that also is slang for like gay male relationships and like, um, but I, but the feeling of like not being able to rise up into the power position unless the one guy who's the king is out of it is something that again goes through, through the through line and there's like never any space for a woman to get into that spot. like. It's uh, the Beowulf poem is so much about about daddy, daddy, father, father, and I I really played that up. Obviously, I God is referred to as um, the Almighty Big Boss, but also as you know, sort of the father, which he often is in everywhere. Um, but I was thinking about just sort of like, yeah, the, the sort of slangification of this kind of attempt, at least for me, to kick down some of the gates that are definitely old white man gates that are like long-standing in terms of the translation of this text which is about 200 years into English and it's pretty much all been not all there there have been a couple of dozen female translators who over the past 50-ish years and also some women who did it at the end of the Victorian era but it's uh but the sort of big bosses were all these were like Tolkien you know and they um they, ha they had as part of their understanding of the important texts that they were using um, noble language or quote unquote noble language that they were using this like very formal language and that that was part of why they were important. 
which I think is, as someone who inherently is kept out of the formal structure, just, I mean, obviously I keep myself out of the formal structure these days, but the, um, but the being kept out of the power structure for generations and millennia as a woman yields a kind of um, cryptographic communication across the board and not just as a woman, but as someone um, in, in the case of like all these texts, there are also characters who are you know, queer and who are, uh, have genders that are potentially non-binary genders and who are othered in various ways by their society, by race and by class. So all these other languages entwine into the English language and they're, they're languages of um, essentially like reverse gatekeeping to keep the patriarchy from getting in and oppressing. And sort of making the bro subtext a bit more textual so that it's not just sort of some unmarked defa default bro as if the whole history is like that, sort of bringing more attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was going to pick up on the theme of queer subtext because uh, there's a lot of that in, in Dickinson as well with Emily's relationship with Sue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, sorry, my, I, I was, I'm, I'm gonna, just going to keep talking about patriarchy for a second. Go ahead. <laughs> no, but it's, it's like, I do, I want to say that, you know, um, the reason why my show is called Dickinson is in some sense to like shine a light on a bit of, for me, an irony, which is, um, and Emily, Emily, the real Emily, she sometimes would sign letters Dickinson. That's how she would mm -hmm. sign off. I mean, sometimes she signed them Emily sometimes Emily Dickinson and sometimes just Dickinson. Um, she also in her poems and this to answer, you know, sometimes refers to herself as a male figure. Like she'll say when I was a boy. Hmm. So there, there's a lot of like queering that goes on even in her poetry. Additionally, as well, we know she had this relationship with her best friend who married her brother, became her sister-in-law and Emily wrote her hundreds of passionate love poems and, and Sue was her muse and possibly her lover or definitely her lover, depending on however you frame that word. But, um, but you know, for me, it's so interesting that um, we take our father's last names or most of us do, right? Um, and uh, that there's this like erasure of the maternal line. Um, but, and in Emily's case, you know, the, the sort of like fundamental irony, at least in season one and in the pilot is that her father is afraid that she will ruin the name Dickinson and, you know, death comes and tells Emily, well, actually you're gonna be the only Dickinson they remember. I mean, you're gonna be the one that makes the name, you know, which, which is true. Um, but, uh, and, and why does Emily keep the name Dickinson? Well, in part, it's because she doesn't get married, right? And, 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 and why doesn't she get married? Well, because, because she loves Sue, because she is queer, um, but, but also because w she has this Faustian bargain arranged with her dad where, you know, she won't show anyone her poems, but he will hire a maid and give her a little bit of time alone in her room so that she can write. If she were to go off and marry a man, even a really nice guy like George who says, oh yeah, I love your writing and I'm gonna let you keep writing. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's too much of a risk. Like it could easily backfire and she could lose even the little bit of agency that she has. So um, she chooses a queer path, um, which is in, in some ways she remains committed to her father, you know, and she, one of her famous lines is like, I never leave my father's, I never cross my father's ground for any house or town. Or, you know, so it gets, it gets more and more exaggerated as she gets older that she sort of like remains in her father's house um, and she remains a Dickinson. Um, but, you know, this is, it's just, it's just interesting to me like that, her name is because of patriarchy. And it's got the sun embedded right in it, even, even though her, you know. <laughs> yeah, and you did have big Dickinson energy at some <laughs> <laughs> Subtitle, big Dickinson energy. It's amazing. <laughs> Well, on that note, maybe we should see a scene from Dickinson because we have one uh, queued up to play for you um, so we can see what it's like inside that house. 
In the whole Kansas-Nebraska Act was just a massive overreach on the part of the slave power. They actually tried to repeal the Missouri Compromise. Like, do they really think we're going to admit more slave states into the Union? The problem is they control the government. We have to build a coalition that can block their legislation. Jean, you're, like, so woke. I know. If I was allowed to vote, I would vote Republican. Good for you. The Republicans are the only ones who explicitly stand against slavery. The true progressives. They're on the right side of history. I know. It's like if you really want justice for all people in this country, you have to vote Republican. Definitely. So. <laughs> um. Um. That was, I, I chose, I mean, I chose that clip because it was like a blend of, of historical fact and modern language, but not, yeah, it, it doesn't it, have it, Emily in it or her dad. So <laughs> it doesn't have Emily or her dad. It does have her sister and a bunch of her sister's friends yeah. uh, for context for those who haven't seen uh, the whole show, which you should definitely check out. Um, and uh, it has them sort of, it also has this sort of juxtaposition of them sort of sitting around sewing, but talking politics about what's what's going on. Uh, in history at the time. Yeah. Um, and it's got the, what is it, Jane, you're so woke. So that might sort of lead us into this question of how, you know, race and cultural appropriation are treated in uh, both of the sort of series and translations. What comes up for you when you're thinking about, okay, is this, is this language that's, that's being used, you know, specifically appropriate from African American English, or is it, you know, where, where are you situating yourself there? I think that's an Elena question first. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> we, we just watched it. So we'll start with Elena. Okay. Um, uh, well, I think that, you know, this is a show that like, you know, from the very beginning has Emily Dickinson set to hip hop music. And so it's certainly inviting at, at all of these questions and they are the right questions to be asking and, and they're they're in infinitely important and complex questions about what it means to be American, what it means to participate in American culture and society. This is also a show, you know, for better or worse, this is a show about a very white privileged family living on the eve of the Civil War and eventually we actually get into the Civil War. Um, and so, you know, I, I, as much as like, like as a white woman myself, I, um, especially in season one, I think it was um, really looking at Emily's identity in terms of this kind of complicated uh, knot of both oppression and privilege. Um, you know, Emily occupies both of those spaces. And, um, but ultimately, uh, you know, what I, what I want to build and, you know, hope am, I am building in this show with this world is a, is a vocabulary that can be used to like um, re-examine and reclaim American history for anyone who hasn't been put at the center of the story. Um, and, you know, I think this is really like urgent work that we all need to be doing right now. And it's happening in a lot of different spaces. Um, uh, including it sounds like Beowulf, um, but like, you know, there, there's this, um, uh, yeah, I guess it's just, um, there's no way to, there's no way to talk about, represent, be in, or experience American history without that being about race. That's just, that's what this country is. Mm. Um, so as a white woman born into essentially New England aristocracy, you occupy one position point in that kind of nap, but, but, you know, you're still in it. And so, um, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, I, I guess it's just there, there's, I, I, I think that the show hopefully um, especially as it goes on and, and the story gets more complex and, and there's, it get the world expands, um, you know, hopefully, I mean, the show like is, is talking about those very questions and asking those questions. And I will just say from a more sort of hit, you know, academic biographical pr perspective, I was very inspired by this book called Made as Muse. Um, which was written by a descendant of one of Emily's Irish maids. 
Oh, um, and this book looks at all of Emily's interactions with people of color, which includes um, African Americans, it includes Native Americans, it includes Irish uh, workers who were not considered white at the time. Um, and it shows not only that Emily interacted with these people, but that their language inflected hers and that you can find this fabulous like melting pot of American dialects and rhythms and slang in Emily's poetry itself. Um, so, you know, the, I, I took my cues from, from some of the historical research as well. Awesome. I should say as a reminder that we're going to be uh, moving into the Q&A in about 10 minutes. Uh, so 10, 15 minutes. So if you have questions um, for either of the panelists or that you'd like us to talk about in general, um, you can please put those in the Q&A function at the bottom uh, and we'll be surfacing some of those later. Um, yeah, Maria, do you have comments on this? I do. I thought a lot about um, every kind of slang. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. I have a gap. I have a sort of lag. Yes. Is I it actually I happening? Are, you fine. are we good? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I was thinking a lot about, um, about hip hop and about rhyme schemes and meter as I was working on this. And in my life, I was born in 1977. So I grew up listening to, to hip hop and listening to people kicking ass, like, like, really being able to destabilize the metric scheme and reinvent it, which is um, something that I think is genius. So I, I wanted to be able to use some of those things and I wanted to try to use them to the best of my ability in this old text. But um, I also wanted to think about appropriative language um, in terms of the way that bro culture has historically worked, which is that it grabs from the most powerful things that it can find and says, now they're mine. I am using them as part of my, as part of my power and they're not yours anymore. So the, the men in this poem often um, use language like that in order to, to claim things that are not their own <laughs> as, as they have done with the, with the, linguistic tropes and with the with the words that are being snatched out of um, out of sort of African American vernacular. Um, and I was just I was just thinking a lot about it because sp very specifically the medieval world was really diverse and it's often portrayed as being just the whiteness like the, the big whiteness, which is not the case. There are, are mm. lots of people of color all throughout that and the concept of whiteness was really a later concept like it wasn't something that was in operation really at that time at all. There were lots of lots of people who were making making words and making poetry and making um, scholarship at that period of time who were not white and are not given credit in our world, which is just bullshit. So I, I was thinking a lot about that and also about the way that white supremacy has claimed the texts of this period as the, the true texts of whiteness and the true texts of sort of nationalist myth which is something that I wanted to get into the Beowulf and say, this is not, free, this is not yours. <laughs> it doesn't just belong to, and it's sort of like Nazis loving Wagner and like loving Norse myth. Like all of, all of that idea is, here's a world, a white utopia world where there are no people of color, which is uh, untrue historically and also just, just untrue in every way. So I wanted to give us a sense of what the world has done over the intervening centuries, but also of what the world always has been with, with the kinds of language that I used in this text. Hopefully not in a questionable fashion, always risky. <laughs> because, you know, you, unless you're just, unless you're not taking, I mean, there are ways to do this without taking any risks. There are ways to just be using the language of like acceptable, the whiteness, which is the, the language of many of these translators are using this thing that they, they are, they are sort of framing as white privilege language, but also as the good language. And, and that's sort of the default or expected language that you could be using. Yeah, and, and it's just, I mean, I don't consider that to be, a, to be English. I think English is a much wider ranging language than that. And it's, and I mean, it, I think, I say, I think, but everyone thinks if you have any I mean, knowledge. Functionally, when we're using English every day, we, we effectively treat it as that. Um, it's just that it's not necessarily rep represented in literature. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, this sort of 
specifically kind of social mediaification of certain types of things because another trope that you see um i don't know if if anyone else is a fan of the uh emergent youtube genre of bardcore um which is in case you know for the uninitiated please look up on youtube bardcore i tweeted a link to uh one of my favorite bardcore songs um and this is people who are taking modern day pop songs and rewriting them with sort of faux medieval or faux archaic lyrics <laughs> um <laughs> it's it's great. Uh, uh, it's and it mostly it has been starting starting during lockdown, uh, and people have a lot of time on their hands. Some people, if they don't have young children, have a lot of time on their hands, uh, and they've been they've been producing things to delight us all. Um, and this sort of so there's there's one respect in which uh, we use you know like the 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 modern day language in in a translation or interpretation of. Um, something that's in the past um, and saying, okay, what if we inject a note of modernism to it? And there's another way in which older terms can become memes and can take on a new life as here's something that can become a meme, here's something that can become a, you know, a, a style of people doing sort of faux archaisms for, for fun. Um, there's a, there's a really great tweet um, talking about uh, the trend of calling things like snakes can be danger noodles uh, or, you know, uh, I think it's, I don't know what kind of fish it is. That's a sea pancake. <laughs> Maybe it's like the flatfish, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and in some senses, this is sort of your old English kennings like whale road brought back again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, and, and Emily Dickinson, I was excited to, to get to, to talk about her because in because internet I cited um, Emily Dickinson as an example of somebody who was using dashes and line breaks to separate uh, out her thoughts. She wasn't trying to write in full sentences all the time. Sometimes she was doing this sort of creative stylized punctuation. That's maybe a lot like how somebody would send a text message. So yeah, do you, do you want to start? Uh, do either one of you want to start talking about sort of how you see the historic stuff showing up uh, in the present day and how that sort of continues to influence us. Well, one thing that's definitely true about Emily Dickinson is that she wasn't following the rules. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that she didn't know what the rules were because she lived in a completely um, like overstuffed literary context. She was surrounded by literature. She, um, you know, she grew up in the town of Amherst, which is this college town, and um, in a in a in, in a time when you know all of culture was just um, about writing. You know, there they, there was like they were getting eight, they subscribed to eight different newspapers and they got magazines and they and and everyone around her practically was a writer. I mean, a lot of them were ministers um, and they were, but, but ministers are writers. They have to write sermons that, you know, and, and, and everyone was reading the Bible all the time. Uh, you know, she grew up in um, actually a very uh, evangelical um, Christian context. And, um, you know, it, she, there were, and poetry was the, was a popular form, you know. There were there were poems published in the new in the newspaper every day, and um, a lot of those poems were totally <laughs> conventional, um, and they rhymed perfectly, and they had perfect meter, and they had perfect punctuation and perfect spelling. And Emily definitely knew what a poem was supposed to look like. Um, and she didn't do it. She did all these really weird things with dashes and weird punctuation and bizarre capitalization. Yeah. Um, and um, and then, I mean, even on a, on a deeper level, like just how hard her poems can be conceptually to, to get inside of and, and wrap your brain around and, um, you know, playing with all different kinds of logics in very incredible ways. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think this is all part of the, for me, this is all part of the mystery of Emily Dickinson, you know, why, why did she write so differently? Where did this voice of hers come from? You know, like what, um, uh, uh, why, why was she breaking the rules? But there's definitely something, you know, she's famous for her dashes 
that that kind of um, frequently are the the ending of a line and the start of another line. And I think they they really do feel like breath. You know, it's 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 like they they in they're they're very long dashes and they kind of. Yeah. In, you know, they're, they're, they're really telling you like where and how to breathe um, in, in the poetry, I think. And um, yeah, and her poems are, are very, they're very condensed, uh, like a text message or a tweet. Um, sometimes people have said that it's because she wrote on these tiny little scraps of paper that she would carry around like, you know, in her pockets, like hidden or sit up. She, her desk is also incredibly tiny. I mean, if you, if you visit the Dickinson homestead, you can see a replica of her desk. I think the real one is actually at the um, Harvard library, but um, you know, her desk is like the size of a postage stamp. Like this is the whole thing that's so fascinating about Emily is that she she kept herself within these tiny constraints, but she just went so wild inside of that. And she really like found the infinite in the small. Um, but yeah, if her, if her dad was willing to hire her a maid, maybe she could have gotten a slightly larger desk if she'd really wanted one. I know, right? <laughs> you know, like, they, didn't, they didn't have larger desks at the time. <laughs> It's true. I don't know. <laughs> like, I was really, when I was reading some more Dickinson poems in, in preparation for this event, I really had this desire to see them as like an aesthetic Instagram account or like a Twitter bot that tweets out one every, you know, couple hours or something. And maybe this exists and I haven't found it yet because it feels like it's, it does. A, it's a sort of size of like the Rupee Cower Instagram poems where you can see those you know, being traded around on social media, they're they're sort of bite-sized and very, very shareable. Yeah. I mean, two of my favorite Twitter accounts that I follow, one is an Emily Dickinson account, and then another is the Moby Dick account, which yeah, exactly. just yeah. crushes it, you know, like it consistently. But it, it really gives like my time on the internet a nice quality because every now and then I just get like a line from Moby Dick and I'm like, okay, it's gonna be fine, you know. <laughs> But yeah. <laughs> uh, Maria, do you want to do you want to comment on this? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm now I'm lost. I'm thinking about things I like to follow on Twitter, but I was going to say um the Chaucer Does Tweet account, which oh, you probably both yeah. know, yeah. is amazing. The guy who does it is amazing. And it's like, you know, it's kind of everything done in the style of Chaucer, which is fascinating to see it sort of going back and forth. The um the sort of for lack of a better word, the kind of highfalutin style of Chaucer, but dirty highfalutin style of Chaucer. Um, it's it's so pleasurable to see it running through the culture in the direction from him and also backward towards him. Is like, I I love I love that that we have we live in this time where we have access because of the internet to everything that exists. Like I can't even imagine. You know, I think about being a writer at the time Emily Dickinson was writing and, and having, you know, I mean, there are many books, but there's not, you don't have like the, the Library of Alexandria in your hands. Like I have at my desk here, this little desk the size of a postage stamp. Um, <laughs> and it's just amazing and beautiful the way that people throughout the centuries have, have kind of grabbed from here and there and everywhere. And we, we're still doing that, but in a, in a way that's much more, um, much more easy and swift. And I, you know, I mean, my feeling always touching old texts, which I do all the time. That's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in old folklore and old mythology and old, old trends linguistically, old, old ways of talking about the same things that we still have. Like, you know, we have like wine dark sea, but we we also still have a sea that we can look at and go, how do I describe it? I don't know. What what words am I going to use? And I think that it's um, you know, there's there's just a certain kind of pleasure and and grounding in imagining the entire history of humans trying to describe the same human things, which are you know, I'm laughing out loud. I, I love you. I want to have sex with you so much. Like, and it's, it's just over and over in all of our storytelling. So much of our storytelling is attempts to get with each other, you know, like, and, or attempts to get enough status that we can get married or enough status that we can um, be in a room where, where something amazing is going to happen and change the world. You know, it's like, I'm going to learn how to tell stories beautifully so that I can do that. And so 
I mean, I don't know. It's all the same, like text from last night. It's the same impulse, you know, and I, <laughs> I, I love that about, about getting to look at it all at once in the way that we can now. Mm. Absolutely. I, it's, it, it, I remember when I was writing because internet, I had to go through this process of teaching myself how to write without hyperlinks because I'd gotten so reliant on the hyperlink as the sort of like, oh, if I just link to the Wikipedia article for this word, I don't need to explain it because people who know it can just keep reading and people who don't know it can just click on the Wikipedia article and provide that additional context. Mm -hmm. And I had to sit down and figure out, okay, how do I use words again? <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it's very sort of, you know, early, early aughts techno babble to be waxing quote unquote hyperlinks. But <laughs> how do I use words again if I don't have this automatic sort of context thing? You know, am I just going to have a gazillion foot footnotes, you know, with, you know, here's what this word means in case you were wondering, am I going to define them in text? Am I going to provide, you know, I'm going to have a glossary at the back. Like, how do I give people that sort of optional amount of context uh, or that optional amount of, of citation? if I don't have hyperlinks there to do it, it sort of changes the way you write a text and changes the way you read a text. It does. I love the idea that, you know, that the hyperlink symbolizes like a whole library that you can just go and like dive into from the text. I mean, what, what glory that that exists. And also I, I agree, like working on this, um, on this, this project, the Beowulf project, I started it out and I was, I was not sure I was going to do it. And so one of the ways that I started working on it because so, to, so that I didn't feel like I was really questionable and suddenly going to translate Beowulf out of nowhere in the middle of my life for no reason, as far as I could tell, I started, I was thumb typing it on my, um, on my phone so that I could pretend I wasn't really translating Beowulf. And it was, you know, it was a good way to do it. It was like, okay, how much, like, as far as the like crunching down of the lines and the, mm. and the, and also the instant access to the library of the universe, which I could like dive from my phone into rhymezone.com. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's changed. I think access has changed so much, but then there's like, it's hard to, to continue to think of a world in which there is no access if you have all the access that we have most of us right now in America. And I, I find that I'm always having to be like, okay, and, and because I'm working on a medieval text, it's like, I, I just go, okay, imagine now that you are living in the 11th century. <laughs> and it takes that. months for news to reach you. And how can you make this understandable to someone who doesn't have the, who can't dive into the library with a click, you know? Yeah, any comments on that, Elena? And then we'll move into questions. Feel free to keep adding questions. Well, I, mean, I, I think that, you know, one, what I, I've always said about, um, Sorry, there's a guy with a leaf blower now outside my house. Um, um, but I've always said that like, you know, with Dickinson, I'm trying to create for the audience um, this kind of like uncanny blur between the past and the present so that uh, my goal is that like, if you were to binge watch, you know, 10 episodes of Dickinson, you might open your eyes and be like, I don't, I don't know, am I in the 19th century? I'm not sure. And like, and part of the way that you, one of the things I, I love to find is like things like oceans and trees <laughs> that, you know, you, you, when you look at a tree, it's still a tree. It's, um, you know, that, 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 so it's, it's, it's as much about like the timelessness as that, which is, you know, defined by a, a certain time. And, um, and that like there, that there's this kind of like seamless blending so that I'm, I'm not trying to have like the modern elements like poking out of the past and and breaking um, the the sense that like this is just a grounded world that these people are are existing in. Um, and a world where you can kind of see some of Emily's own sort of dream logic or fantasy logic of her interacting with death as personified or some of the things that are in the poems that are in her head you can see them because that's what you can do with television as a medium, um, you know, where, okay, this is going to be about volcanoes, so we'll see some volcanoes, or this is going to be about uh, a particular thing, so we'll actually get to see that. Well, right, I mean, the, this is also a show about a person whose outer circumstances were really pretty unbelievably mundane, 
and mm -hmm. whose inner world was, you know, as exciting as, as anyone's has ever been. Um, and so there is also that fact too, that like for, for a poet, uh, what, what goes on in the imagination is, is as real, sometimes more real than what's going on in day-to-day -day life. That's a great note to move into questions on. Um, so the, the question for both of you, how much do you think the, the use of social media slang puts your work in a very specific context, given how quickly it changes? Do you worry it may seem outdated by 2021? Uh, or is that part of the joy of this kind of work? Um, um, people are very worried about that on my behalf and like, <laughs> <laughs> they, they constantly are going, don't you feel worried that this will seem archaic in two years and that it will be outdated? And I'm like, if no. I would, if I'd done faux archaisms, it would have been outdated before it even got printed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's a silly, I think it's silly because I like my feeling is always I want to write to the world that we live in. I am not trying to write necessarily to the world 50 years from now. If I do, that's cool, but that's not that's not who I'm writing for right now. I'm writing for us in this moment that we're living in, in 2020. And this translation was for that. And, um, and thus it used a thousand years of English all smashed together. It's just that we've seen the recent evolution of language in the last 20 years and it's really fast. We're like watching it happen and we're seeing words die and we're seeing words we've born sort of daily. So people have a, a certain kind of panicky prudishness about it, I think. Um, and the fear that you're using the wrong slang for something is with all of us. The, feel, the fear that you're like suddenly aging out of language is with all of us. I also I feel of, like I would have been delighted if there had existed a version, a translation of, you know, anything from 50 years ago or 100 years ago that was using like 60s slang yeah. <laughs> to juxtapose that with, with Beowulf or with Dickinson or with any of these other sort of adaptations. That sounds really fun to me. Yeah, it would be um, so fun or like, or like sort of guys and dolls kind of slang or something. Right. Like that. I mean, yeah. it's, it's fun. It makes it its own thing of the moment, but also... The moment is interesting. It's not like the moment is boring. It's not like- Yeah, like this, this period will eventually pass into history, but it'll still be part of the history of the language. Mm -hmm. uh, Elena, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, it's funny too, because so much like you, Maria, so I was born in 1980 and grew up listening to hip hop. And that's, I mean, I also, I have said to people before when they've asked me the question of like, why? Why, why do you have hip hop in Dickinson? And I can give like a whole answer about, about like, you know, American history, but I can also just say that, you know, I grew up like in the Hudson Valley of New York, like walking past like horse farms, but listening to Wu-Tang, you know, mm -hmm. like it was actually just my experience. It's like, I looked around at a landscape that could have been the 19th century, but I was listening to rappers. Um, and, um, but my point here also is to say that like, I'm already old. Like <laughs> I, I have in my show many, many thriving, beautiful 20 somethings who tell me that, you know, my taste in music is actually a little outdated. And like my slang is, and like, we have a lot of nineties references in Dickinson because it's coming from me. <laughs> and I have to kind of, I don't know, somebody just sent me a, somebody just sent me a like, some Instagram video of a guy doing like Gen Z slang and I'm like taking notes so that I know <laughs> what is, you know, cause I have to like stay with it cause I actually don't know. Um, so, so I don't know. I mean, I think, I think that like, you know, it's not, um, in, in other words, like this is also something that's just, this is just my voice and it's, it's my authentic voice. And it's not, it's not like some, uh, you know, mathematical precise rendering of exactly what social media is right now you know it's it's so so I think that that's you know what we what we we, we like to hear the sound of a 
of a truthful voice out of any period, hopefully. And that's that's one of the ways of sort of avoiding that sense of cringe of the sort of how are you fellow kids, which is apparently a, a millennial meme and the Gen, Gen Z kids don't uh, think of it as old person, an old person meme itself, uh, which has this delicious level of irony, uh, <laughs> you know, of saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this as, as I am. And it might not even be how the, the teens are doing things now, but it is at least a snapshot of a particular person rather than trying to project uh, your own ideas onto teenagers, which is always very dangerous. I think I'm going to combine two other questions. Um, one of which is, can you name other historical works that are ripe for modernizing? Another of which is, maybe you don't want to put anyone on blast, but I'm curious if you have examples of modernized text gone gone wrong. So either sort of potential for doing doing things, or uh, you know things that that you think didn't work as well. Every time a question like this happens, it's as though I've never read any books. Or <laughs> any. Well, I, well, I was going to say, I mean, so in 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 the most, we've sort of completed our writer's room for season three of Dickinson because life is weird and things don't go in or but whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and it, you know, we I had the, a, a lot of conversations that came out of that room have made me think like that we need we immediately need a show with a black protagonist in a black world about um you know it, there's and i mean there's a billion parts of american history you could do but like that i would like to see that show i would like to see the period version of atlanta like mm -hmm. immediately you know mm -hmm. um so yeah that there there's so much there in terms of like what needs to be said um, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that completely. Like, there is so much history that has not even been touched. Like, in terms of, I mean, some of it is stuff that's really, like, written down and we can read it, but it hasn't been put out into the popular world so that it's just like only specialist knowledge. And that particularly includes the work of so many people of color. Um, throughout the history of America who just didn't get put into the canon and should have been put into the canon. There's a, a woman named Phyllis Wheatley who was a poet and she um, was a, a poetic prodigy, a kind of Dickinson style poetic prodigy um, who, you know, young black woman very, was, was sort of yanked into slavery and and then was like speaking like six languages, basically. <laughs> like she was a badass and she's just not famous. Like we don't know about her um, or at least white America doesn't know about her. Maybe black America knows about her. And I hope so because she's like, she should, she's a canonical figure and should be a canonical figure. So my feeling is always like expand the fucking canon, make it what it really should be, which is everybody. Like all of us living here on this planet impacting the planet, impacting the language, impacting the storytelling, being part of the stories and frequently the stories that um, were told by sort of uh, very privileged white society were stories about here we are, here we're the heroes and then there are all of these other characters and in the, in the stuff that I usually do it's like monsters and heroes so what happens is that the monsters are the people of color and the monsters are the queer people and the monsters and so, you know, like there's all this work that was created by the people who got smooshed down into other categories. They were the heroes of their own stories and should be the heroes of the canon just as much as the people who have consistently been the heroes of the canon in the last 100, 200 years. I think that's a wonderful note to end on for today. Uh, hopefully we uh, do see more of those sort of biopic treatments or wonderfully creative reimagining treatments or everywhere in between uh, from uh, from lots of different other other authors um, as, since we're, we've hit uh, one o'clock. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for coming, especially thank uh, Maria and Alina for being our wonderful panelists today uh, and to, to Dan and Natish for performing uh, for us. Uh, and uh, for all of you, stay tuned for Future Tense's next event on Wednesday, December 2nd, uh, which is Heat Map, A Climate of Change in America. Thanks everybody, bye.